Hi everyone, this is Dr. Mike, host of the free iTunes podcast, Psychiatric Secrets Revealed, but that's not why I'm here today. This is another Saving Savvy episode, and this time we're going to talk about using a manual flash and saving yourself some money. Now, many cameras, not all, have a built-in flash. And despite a lot of those gurus on YouTube saying that they're useless, I think they're very, very useful for casual photography. But they do have their limitations. One limitation is, is that it's just not a very big flash tube, and so you can only illuminate so much space. The other limitation is that it's a very small source of light, which tends to be a very direct source, which creates a lot of shadows, and it's just not very flattering. So when I bought my first DSLR in 2003, a Digital Rebel, the first accessory that I bought wasn't a Nifty 50 for portraiture, it was actually a flash gun. And so today we're going to talk about flash guns, talk a little bit about them in general, and then talk about using a manual flash. So here's a good standard regular flash gun. This is a fully automatic Nikon SB700. Now this flash does everything you'd want an external flash to do. It is a much bigger light source, right? I can modify that light in many ways, so I can bounce it off my white ceiling here and shower the subject with light, giving them a nice soft light and make them look a lot better. I can put gels and things on here. And I can also take this flash and operate it when it's not connected directly to the camera, doing all sorts of creative effects. This particular flash, being an automatic flash, does other things too. So for instance, it'll do some fancy things like high-speed sync. So if I need to shoot something with a flash at one four thousandths of a second, for instance, I can do that with this flash. But I never really have to do that, so it's kind of a waste of money for me. The other thing this flash will do is what's called TTL, or through the lens metering. And when this flash communicates with the camera, right before it sends out its main flash, it'll send out a little pre-flash. That flash goes out, bounces back into the camera, and together the camera and the flash figure out the perfect exposure completely automatically most of the time, not all of the time. So awesome flash why not just go with this well this particular flash again a mid-range Nikon is about $330 the top of the line Nikon which is the SB5000 is about $600 if you want to use a couple flashes you're talking about big money now you can buy off-brand TTL flashes but to get the ones that are more full featured they're also pretty expensive not nearly as expensive as this however well how about a flash like this this is the Power Extra DF400. Looks very similar. Construction is not quite as good, but very similar. The back, though, reveals a little bit difference. This looks very, very complicated. This looks very, very simple. And this particular uh, flash I bought on Amazon for about $25. So I could buy more than 11 of these for one of these. So there's your savings right there. And the light coming from this is exactly the same as the light coming from any other flash. Your camera doesn't know the difference. The one difference is, is that instead of using the computers on board the flash, you're using your brain. Now, the thing that you're probably thinking right now is, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to use some heavy math or some app on my phone or calculate each picture or use one of those grids where I'm comparing this with that. And it's just not true. It's very, very, very simple to use a manual flash. The nice thing about a manual flash, too, is that it's going to work on any camera that has a standard hot shoot. So I can use this on my, on my Nikon, I can use this on my Canon, I can use this on my Fuji camera. Um, same flash, don't have to have three different flashes, and very, very inexpensive. So let's talk a little bit about theory. So we all know this, is, I'm going to put it here because you can actually see it better. This is the, turn this way a little bit, this is the exposure triangle. And when you take a proper exposure of a picture, three things determine that exposure. One is the ISO, which is the gain on the sensor. We can think of that as, as the sensitivity of the sensor. The higher the ISO, the more sensitive the sensor is to light. So you can take something in a darker environment. However, you do that at the cost of a degradation in the picture. Aperture is how wide the opening is on the lens through the iris. So a very wide aperture is going to let in a lot more light and I can shoot in darker conditions or with less light. Shutter speed also can determine the exposure. So the longer the shutter speed, 
the more light comes in. So a 1 60th shutter speed lets in twice as much light as a 1 120th second shutter speed. It's twice as long. Well, when you go to flash or manual flashes or any kind of flash, really, the equation changes a little bit. I'll put this back here so you can see it. ISO and aperture remain the same, but instead of shutter speed, we talk about flash power. On a manual flash, you adjust flash power very simply. You just move this little bar thing back and forth, full power, down all the way to 128th power on this particular kind of flash. You're all set. You put it on the camera, take the picture, boom, it takes the picture. So why not shutter speed? Well, that's because there are things that, well, let me, let me try this. I'll show you again why not shutter speed. So how long is this? Time it right now. Couldn't time it? Well, I'll tell you. It's probably one one thousandth of a second or less. And so what that means is, is that the majority of light that this camera is going to receive in a flash picture is going to happen in a thousandth of a second. So I'm, if I'm at a thirtieth of a second, it's still getting most of its light at one one thousandth of a second. If I'm at a hundred and twenty-fifth of a second, it's still getting most of its light at one one thousandth of a second. The exposure will be the same at either of those those ranges. So why would you even bother to adjust shutter speed? Well, I may choose a faster shutter speed to freeze action. I may choose a slower sp shutter speed to maybe create motion or a feeling of motion or to let in more ambient light for a creative effect. But the majority of the light is going to happen in one one thousandth of a second. Now, so you would think, well, why not take a flash picture at one one thousandth of a second then if you can do that? And what's going to happen is what you're going to see right now. So here we're at 1 250th of a second, 1 500th of a second, and now at 1 1,000th of a second. And you can see that much of the image is being covered. And that's because we have exceeded the flash sync speed. So on Nikon cameras, the flash sync speed is 1 250th of a second. I think on a lot of Olympus cameras, it's 1 200th of a second. And I believe on Fuji cameras, it's like 1 uh, 180th of a second. So the sync speed varies from camera to camera, maybe even from um, model to model. But you always have to stay at that sync speed or lower when you're using a flash, unless you're doing something like high speed sync. Again, that's something you probably won't do very often. Why is that? Well, it has nothing to do with our flash. It has more to do with the mechanics of the shutter in the camera. So, these kinds of cameras have a two-leaf system. So what happens is you have uh, like a curtain here, or like maybe two curtain system, and a curtain here. When I take a picture, the front curtain moves all the way up and exposes the sensor, and then the bottom curtain comes up and closes the sensor and then it resets all right so there's a, t a time when the sensor is completely exposed at lower shutter speeds and as soon as that sensor is all the way up that a curtain is all the way up that's when the flash fires at high shutter speeds the sensor has to the bottom curtain has to move up faster just to make that shutter speed happen so as this is going and exposing the film or the, the sensor, the other bottom B curtain is rising up at the same time. So instead of having a completely exposed sensor, you have a partially obstructed sensor. Now in regular photography in the daylight, it makes no difference because the sensor is still getting light, just getting it in a stream as opposed to one big thing. But remember that's one one thousandth of a second. So if you shoot that flash at a high speed, some of the sensor is going to be obstructed by this curtain moving up. So that's why you have to shoot at the sync speed for your camera or lower. So what are my recommendations if you're just getting used to doing this? Well, where's my little cheat sheet? I think I've lost my cheat sheet. Well, I'll just tell you what the recommendations are then. So you need to do everything in manual. And that means, since this is a manual flash, you'll be doing everything in here in manual. Controls are super simple, but you'll also be using the M or the manual control on your camera. And you will adjust your ISO manually. So you absolutely have to get rid of the auto ISO, put it on a manual function. 
Now you can set that ISO anywhere you want, but I would recommend setting it between 400 and 800. 800 if you have a more modern camera, 400 if you have an older camera that maybe is not as good at high ISOs. The reason I suggest using an ISO of around 800 is because most pictures will look perfectly fine, but you'll require a lower strength flash, which means your batteries will last longer and you'll recycle that flash quicker. You want to do something different, do something different. Um, so ISO around 800, older camera around 400. How about aperture? Well, again, you can pick whatever you want, but I like starting out at an f of 5.6. That's great for portrait work. That's great for like a couple people sitting at a wedding table or something. It has enough depth of field so you're gonna get everyone in focus if it's not too deep of a group. Um, and yet it's wide enough again, so we're letting enough light in so we can use lower power levels so we can have fast, faster recycle times and less wear and tear on our batteries. Now, if you want an artistic effect, you want to go way down to 2.8, fine. If you want to go, you, get a, you have a big deep group where you want to get everyone in focus, you want to go up to an F8 or an F11, fine. Just remember, you're going to have to adjust your, your flash strength. So you have everything on manual, auto ISO is off, ISO is set to 800, F is set at this point anyways at 5.6. Where are you going to set the power on your manual flash? Well, usually someplace in the middle is what I find works pretty well. And I'll take that first picture and I'll look. Does it look underexposed? Does it look overexposed? If it's um, a little bit, I'd rather have a little bit underexposed, honestly, than overexposed. Um, and once I have it set on that first table, all the other tables will be the same because I'm shooting at the same distance, the light is roughly the same, and I can just go with that one setting, bam, 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 bam. And after you use that flash for a while, you're gonna know, okay, I'm taking something a little bit further, I have to go a little more power, I'm taking something a little closer, I have to go a little down power. But within that first shot, or maybe within two shots, you're gonna have your flash power set perfectly, and you just go and take pictures, like you would take pictures with a TTL flash with the only difference being that this one is 11 times cheaper. So I really think that if you want to get into flash photography, I would suggest getting a manual flash. Now this is one that I just picked up again, very cheap, this Power, um, I can't even, there's my glasses, Power Extra, uh, 25 bucks. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with this particular flash. It's fairly new, the head feels a little bit wobbly. Um, one brand that I do, uh, this is much better, much more solid feeling, uh, used quite a bit, is this newer brand, and this is the TT560. Again, very similar control layout, a little bit different. Um, this one I know is the newer, is very reliable. I've also used a brand called Yang Nuo. Um, I don't, they, they, I have flashes that look just like this from Yang Nuo. I don't know if they still make that particular flash. I think they've got a little more upscale, but if you can find those flashes, they're also very good and around 30 bucks. So certainly worth your money, certainly worth your effort. Really set it up, buy one, fool around a little bit. Within a half an hour of trial and error, you're going to know how to use a manual flash. And you're going to say, wow, I can now do all these awesome things. Now, these flashes will also operate off camera using what's called slave mode. But that's a whole different topic that I'll hopefully cover on a different video. I don't want to like overwhelm you with all kind of information. So if you get some time, please give my podcast a listen. You can find it on iTunes. It's called Psychiatric Secrets Revealed. If you like this video, I really, really would appreciate a thumbs up. And I really would like it if you subscribe. These kinds of things make me want to do more videos. I guess if you don't want me to do any more videos, then don't do any of that stuff. Um, the other thing that I do is an experimental writing, a uh, little experiment called, uh, it's my blog, drmikekuna.com, D-R-M-I-K-E-K-U-N-A.com. And really, I, I started this, this blog a while back just so I would, in a public forum, talk about feelings and things that are going on in my life. And I'm doing this to really improve my writing if, if I eventually want to write something um, a little more um, a little more complex. I want to be able to really talk about my feelings. And so this kind of puts me out there. So if you want to learn more about me, check out my blog. If not, don't. Hey, have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.